Hey everyone, welcome to Queerly Recommended, the podcast where we recommend queer books, films, TV shows, and more. I'm Tara Scott, and I review sapphic fiction at the Lesbian Review and Smart Bitches Trashy Books. And this week, I'm recommending a sapphic romance novel set in the 1980s. Chris Bryant is out this week living her best life as she is on her way to Women's Week, which of course will be over by the time this goes up. But that means that I am thrilled to be joined by my friend Bex. Welcome to the show, Bex. Do you want to tell people a little bit about yourself? Hey, Tara. Yeah, my name is Bex. I think I'm here mostly because you and I met at GCLS. I am the newest director of outreach for GCLS. Uh, and in a past life, I did kind of what you're doing without the same enthusiasm and intelligence. You're <laughs> who I needed to be when I was younger, so to speak. And uh, just an avid reader who found their way into the community because I love the books and by proxy, love talking to the people who create these worlds. So, yeah. You've, I mean, if you're on Twitter and you listen to the show, then you've probably seen Bex hyping everybody online because you're just this like beacon of kindness and positivity. So yeah, it is because we met at GCLS. So we had sort of, I think, like tweeted at each other a little bit back and forth over the years. But, you know, I've talked a lot on the show about how like I went and I was like, oh, no, it's the first day at school and it's a school where I've heard the names of many people <laughs> uh, but not actually met a lot and yeah so it's just it was so fun meeting and getting to spend a lot of time with you and Brenna and with Chris being out I was like hey I think it's time for us to talk books together <laughs> um, this feels like the equivalent of you know when you, I don't want to call it a parasocial relationship because we do engage with each other, like personally mm -hmm. through text messages and other things. But when you're just like, oh God, I got, I got invited to like the senior table as a freshman. That's what feeling <laughs> you know, like talking to you and Brennan together or you and Chris together feels like. It's that you're this established table that a lot of people want to seat at. And when you offer me one, I'm like, wait, me, I'm, it's my turn in line. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, I want it. But also, are you sure there's not somebody else? So I'll get over that, but you'll probably hear that a few times today. So I, you know, super stoked to be part of anything related to you and Chris's work. Well, and I'm pretty sure people are going to be stoked to hear you talk about stuff too, though, because I saw there were a lot of people that you were, you were also uh, pretty famous and popular at GCLS. So registration has opened for next year. Where's it going to be? What's going to be happening? What should people yeah. know if they're considering it for the first time? You know, uh, I, I should be much faster on the draw for this. So Betsy, if you're listening, I promise to be better in the future. And Betsy is the president behind GCLS. Uh, we're going to be in Albany next year. One of the best things about GCLS within the continental United States is uh, the positioning of the conference changes. So sometimes those travel restrictions aren't as restrictive and or we get to uh, reach new community members. So part of like my outreach is not only within the community that we all participate in, but the communities we're entering. So we'll be in New York next year. Uh, really exciting to be doing that in July. And then I just kind of wanted to make sure that you knew as somebody who went for the first time last year, over 30% of our participants last year were new to GCLS. So if it's the first day of school, you know, if you randomly walked up to four people, statistically one to two would also be their first year. So, you know, that's exciting pretty cool. for you. That's yeah. pretty cool. So is that, so when you said director of outreach, does that mean like this is all on you? You're the one who's talking to people in Albany, seeing what's up, what we should be doing when we're not on the GCLS grounds? I can definitively say, no, it's not just me. It, you know, it takes a village. And the one thing about the board for GCLS, it's a very, very working board. Everybody has at least six hats, but one title. So there is a team that, uh, you know, positions the city and figures things out. There's an entire group that tries to get maps together and position like restaurants and outreach. Uh, my big thing going into this year is my first like full time being fully acclimated in the role is there's a lot of local libraries, reading groups, uh, people who would love to get their books signed, but don't necessarily have the time, funds or ability to attend the full conference. So how do we within that geographic community like position ourselves to make sure that we're continuing to grow GCLS as a, a community event, much more than just the conference, right? Because it mm -hmm. does go way beyond that. But the conference is kind of that cherry on top every year. So it's the thing most of us talk about uh, the loudest. So my job is to kind of fill in the gaps underneath what the conference is. So I know a lot of authors get involved with GCLS as an organization because it has writing academies and like resources to kind of grow as an author. What do you all do for readers? Yeah, 
You know, that's a great question. And I'm a person learning in real time. When I first found GCLS, a lot of my apprehension was like, oh, this seems to be a writer's retreat much more. I'm Mm -hmm. a reader. I don't have too many plans to be a writer. I think everybody kind of gets asked that question, but you know, Mm -hmm. not really the lane I want to drive in. What's happened from my understanding during the 20 years that GCLS has been here is there's been much more of a development over time to go from just the authorship component or the up and coming authors who are working, you know, possibly through the Writing Academy, which I highly recommend checking out. I don't want to speak about it because I'm still learning, but they're introducing the third section. But what's come up with it is readers have started coming because they are doing reviews, such as the panel you and I shared last year. And that Mm -hmm. becomes an outreach mechanism for both readership and authorship. There's also this community building of readers finding each other in person and discussing things together, as well as sitting next to the authors they're with and both saying those things that really excite them, the questions they still have about what's going on in the communities of those characters. I think you and I will probably dive into that a little bit more in the future. Yeah, yeah. And then there's also this component of like, what is chosen family of the readership world? I will give TikTok some credit here. TikTok very much has elevated readers finding readers. And there's much more Mm -hmm. of this grandiose build right now of like, we are community as well. And it's community adjacent instead of community separate. So I, I think GCLS is very much learning how to use their readership as not only an additional like glo- like building of the community, but really an amplification of everything that GCLS stands for. If you want to mm-hmm. get out the mission statement, find your readership first. The authors will come. They want to sell their books. They have livelihoods, but the readers mm-hmm. are the ones who really make sure that it survives. Yeah, that's super interesting. The way you're talking about, I'm going to go on a tangent, but the way you're talking about community is very like adjacent to something that's been going on with Smart Bitches Trashy Books. So that's, you know, I'm a staff writer there. And Sarah recently introduced a new area of the site and it is it's it is paid because unfortunately like with the with the way things have gone online it's very difficult to keep a blog as a business going without basically making a site completely unusable it's called smart bitches after dark and a couple of days ago i had the opportunity to take over her podcast smart podcast, trashy books, because I basically, I had said, you know, like we've, we, you and I have talked before in the past, we're both marketers. I'm a product marketer. So as a product marketer, I think about how do you launch things? And I said, you should have somebody interview you on your own podcast to talk about this new feature. And she said, sounds great. You want to do. <laughs> so I interviewed her and Amanda Deal, who's also, um, she's on staff there about it. And we were really getting into the whole The importance of this is that it is community and it's, yes, it's community paid, but you are coming in for a real community where we can be more of ourselves because it's behind a paid login. There is that ability to kind of like be more yourself, be more genuine, get real when talking about books. And I don't know if we'll ever get to that kind of a place with like a lesbic specific community. I mean, definitely, you know, sapphic readers are welcome and should come and I'll be contributing content to it as well. But that's where, you know, you might hear some things that aren't talked about a little bit as freely because I think I have a tough time occasionally as a reviewer in our space when, you know, a new post will pop up somewhere, probably Facebook. And it's this like authors put a lot of work into their books and therefore you can only be nice in your reviews. And I agree with the first part. Authors put a ton of work into their books. Every author does. I know they deeply care. But I also think we need to be real about what's working and not working in a book, especially as a critic who people follow. If I don't call out something egregiously bad or harmful or whatever, I'm going to have people in my inbox. And so I like that with Smart Bitches After Dark, there is going to be this ability to have some of those more real conversations like what happens perhaps in text conversations like you and I and Brenna have um, <laughs> yeah without the caveat in parentheses of me being like this is said in you know <laughs> in absolute whatever and and yes everything you just said if I could just record that and repeat yeah, that yeah. back all the time because <laughs> I feel that there's this odd thing that happens where the feminine part of our community. And I mean, feminine as conditioned growing up in a male centric world 
is where like money is taboo. We shouldn't talk about it, right? Saying yeah. that you didn't care for something is taboo, even if you're coming behind it with, I didn't care for it because I statements, right? It's, it's mm -hmm. very singular and it's not to the whole community, but I find when X happens, it doesn't allow me to participate in Z. And what people hear yeah. is they trash me for Z. And it's like, no, what they expressed is like, there is these series of things that connected together that disconnected this final product. And we kind of have this thing of when we talk authentically about money or about need to protect ourselves, our careers, and where that looks and how easily accessible it is, as well as supporting our own community and where the dollars go, you know, and mm -hmm. how that kind of looks. It's like, well, when you do percentages of percentages of population, let's, you know, overestimate and say 10% of the United States population identifies as queer. I think those numbers are a little bit higher now with the younger generation. That's only still 10% of that pool of voices and money and outreach that is then all competing within those spaces together. And it's okay yeah. to acknowledge that and to talk about it and say, like, if you want any of this to survive, we've got to figure out how to get a full solid percent besides and behind one of these projects. Yes. Because if we're all competing for a tenth of a percent, nobody's going to make it, right? And we, the other teams have 90% that will put a dollar behind them in some capacity. So they're fighting for far fewer dollars overall. And, and yes. we, have to, we have to really candidly talk about how much, even though we're statistically less likely to make the same dollar, how much more powerful our $1 is when we engage with it into things we care about. So I, that's not what this mm -hmm. podcast episode is about, but like, no, I'm but you're a thousand percent. <laughs> yeah. You're making me think of another thing too, because I mean, it is one thing to say like, look, can we be real in, in reviews? And I just go ahead and do it. And I think I've actually become more okay with doing it as a result of having been on staff at, at smart bitches trashy books for so long because the expectations of the readership there are so high and sarah is such a great editor and that's where i learned things like don't talk about the author in a review ever talk about the book because when you talk about the author you're reviewing the author you're not actually reviewing the book um and i think that's something we need a little more of over in our part but I think also, I know there was a lot of frustration as mainstream publishers started putting out sapphic romances. And what I want to know is how can we connect the people that are finding those books with the literal thousands of books that have been published by, you know, Bold Strokes is a medium-sized press. And then you have other, I don't know exactly where they sit, but they're somewhere in the medium to small with like, Bella and Ilva and Bywater and Affinity and the other Flashpoint. And if I didn't name you, I'm so sorry. It doesn't mean you don't matter. It means that I just forgot. Like, how do we connect these readerships so that it's not the same three books from Book Talk all the time, but instead they're feeding into each other? Like, I will admit when we were at GCLS and we were at the awards dinner and I was looking at all the books nominated and I was like, how the fuck did a book from Tor end up? What? Like they're a really big publisher. What's up with that? And when I heard her speech, when she won, there were like two or three speeches that ruined me. And that was one of them. I mean, Quinn's, of course, Quinn Riley, when, when she won, like just fighting for our literature, oh. fucking incredible. But this one, oh, I'm getting choked up thinking about it. Like it just... When she talked about them being part of the queer silent migration. Oh in my the God. state we were in for the award ceremony on top of it. So it was yes. like receiving recognition oh. at home with when home has to be, when home is not the house that you thought was home, right? Yeah. That, that idea, like yeah. we talk all the time about chosen family, but chosen family also the city that you dwell in, the town you dwell in, the township you dwell yes. in, that is chosen family just as much. That street that you're on, that cul-de-sac yeah. that you're in, that apartment complex wing those four buildings just together, that counts as that chosen family. Yeah. And I, I'm going to, I'm going to amplify a bit with what you're saying with Tor and even, you know, some of the others. And then you mm -hmm. mentioned Quinn and Quinn does, you know, audible exclusive books, which is its own thing of like, if Amazon yeah. is controlling it, how accessible is it? And we have independent authors who seem to kind of be put into conflict with these small publications instead of you mm -hmm. are holistically lifting up together. Right. Yes. Um, and if Tor has, if Tor decides in one of their secondary pages when you open the book to say GCLS winner and somebody's like, what the heck is GCLS? What's yes. Oh my that God. That is such powerful marketing that I could never be able to raise enough yep. money to fundraise for, right? There's also yep. this idea that 
and, and you can cut this, but I will always be on this tangent of the reason that tour, the reason that, you know, the big five independent presses under them or, or sub presses or anything are choosing to publish in mass at this level is not the fault of Alexandra Belfleur or Alison Cochran or these authors that we mentioned who've gone this route. What it is, is those publishers have said, okay, well, we will take on these authors because of mm -hmm. the trails that were literally burned by independent publishers and the thousands of books that people consume. And we see those metrics. I... Looking at the Amazon top 50 alone of like what is trending for lesbian mm -hmm. romance or lesbian mystery or bisexual fiction, publishers look at those lists every day. And what they see most of the time is it's not their books. So now I know that there are conversations happening internally of like, why aren't we having the books that are here in the top 50? So they're going to come because they know yeah. that there is a consumer and it is capitalism, mm -hmm. but let's, let's manipulate it for us just as much as this like being taken advantage of by them. Well, and I think what we're also seeing now, why it is important that these big publishers are picking up authors like Meryl Wilsner and Alexandria Belfleur and Casey McQuiston, these publishers are also the ones who are bringing the lawsuits against governments who are banning books. And like, let's be super honest, those kinds of lawsuits, when you're taking on a government in Texas, when you're taking on a government in Louisiana, like that takes money. You have to have lawyers, you have to have pockets that are deep enough to take that on. And most of the small presses, are unlikely to have those kinds of resources. And so now I'm at the position where it's not just my, like the way I've sort of been all along. I will admit I was annoyed when I saw some of the things that were being said about Alexandria Belfler winning the Lambda Literary for lesbian romance. But also, let's be honest, at, at, like when you look at the nominees for lesbian romance that make it like whatever the top five is, most years I look at it and at least one and sometimes all five, I'm like, who the fuck is that? What is that? Like, it doesn't reflect the sapphic fiction reading community necessarily, which doesn't mean it's not legitimate. It's perfectly fine that that's how it goes. Caveat, I was on staff as a writer for Lambda Literary Review for several years. But for me, it was all about like, okay, how do we start connecting readerships? Who is reading her that hasn't discovered all of these over here? But now I think the ability to do the lawsuits is so important. I mean, anybody who listened to our recent episode is called Hands Off Our Books. It's about Project 2025. It's about the state level things that have happened to try to prevent access to queer literature. Chris and I talked to Laura Green from the Sapphic Book Review podcast. Y'all absolutely <laughs> killed it. Yes, from the Sapphic Book Review podcast. And I was I was biking home. I actually stopped, called my wife and said, hey, instead of the 17 minute ride, I'm going to take the 45 minute ride home because I was finishing it, mm -hmm. you know, so thank you for that. Mm -hmm. But like, it's like, I don't, I don't really want to stop this conversation mid conversation because I thought that your trail of thoughts and how you were processing through it together was so vital to the conversation and yeah. how we have it internally as a team. I also learn a lot about myself by what I hitch my wagon to in that conversation. Like, what do I want to see more of, or what do I want to participate in? Mm -hmm. I, I highly recommend, not that I should tell anybody to stop an episode they're listening to, but I'll still be here. <laughs> stop no, this one, do it. go Absolutely. listen to it, come back. And those are sometimes also the conversations that then allow, I'm not really political at work, but I guess here, like inherently, if you're queer, you're political, right? Your existence mm -hmm. is always highly political. So if anybody at work is listening to this, eh, well, I'm a person too. But uh, <laughs> and hello, <laughs> hi. hi, stay our clients. I'm very good at my job. I don't brag about myself many places, but I make you money. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but you know kind of when you enter some of those spaces I find with more of my I don't even think moderate is a thing but let's call some people moderate and you enter those conversations and they try to push back I'm like so I need you to understand that not only are you just saying okay hey don't don't talk about this like just kind of keep your personal stuff personal because mm -hmm. that's how you view your heterosexuality you do not walk into a bookstore, see a book, say, I'll grab it next time and have or have to think to yourself, I'm not sure if I can grab it next time. You don't yeah. have to think about if a young person is in school with a cover that is representing something that threatens somebody's insecurities to a level that they feel the need to control it, that that student will then be punished for the action of that. You don't have to think about the safety of the authorship 
who decided to take the opportunity to tell a story that was either what they needed when they were younger or an expansion of maybe an experience that they've been privy to. Like there's never a moment when you engage in creative art where just the idea of being happy is threatening and that is vital. So again, like that podcast was not only discussing kind of what could happen, it was amplifying how much has been done to get here. And sometimes I think, you know, within our community, we stand on the shoulders of giants. So we can always mm -hmm. see further than they can because they've lifted us up. But we have to remember the pressure that we're putting on them and to occasionally alleviate that, come down and talk to them and hear their stories before we go back up again. Yeah, it's true. And honestly, like I am concerned enough that I've started to try to figure out, okay, I have probably in my Kindle account over 2000 books. And I recently got a new Kindle. It was time. So they're not all downloaded on there yet, but I was like, okay, do I need to find a way to download everything? Do I need to find a way to get everything onto my computer? Basically. I don't know that Amazon will go so far as to nuke 90% of my Kindle library for LGBTQ representation if Trump were to get in and Project 2025 was rolled out in full. I also don't know that I want to take that chance. Like I had at first thought, do I need to get physical copies of all of my favorite books? Well, that would get very expensive very quickly. <laughs> and so now I basically have this like, okay, well, if Trump gets in, then this is, I am going to start, he's not president until January. I will start the process of making sure everything ends up on my computer. But to bring it back to what we were talking about, this is why it goes from like, thinking, okay, big publishers, maybe they can bring new readership that we can help guide somehow to the presses that we know and love and the indie authors that we know and love to, oh, thank fuck. Okay. They have the money. They can join on with the ACLU they can do these lawsuits together with Stephen King and all these other people that are signing on for them. So yeah, yeah. it's, um, it's, it's wild times. I mean, you brought it full circle back to like the importance of that after dark and that investment of that dollar, right? Because mm -hmm. people will fight in those big companies if they think it's hitting their bottom line. And we are a big, loud bottom line, you know, and I know money isn't sexy, but money also doesn't have feelings. So we can talk dirty about it as much as we want to, right? We don't have to worry yeah. about anything. And there is big publishers publishing our stories because they know there are big dollars behind it. And mm -hmm. We need to, like you said, you don't attack the author, you don't comment on the author, no. you comment on the book. There should be a responsibility within our community to also not be angry. And like jealousy and envy naturally ensues. We all work through our own stuff. But if your first reaction when you see a book is to like have some animosity towards that author, I think maybe the bigger conversation is what was appealing to the publisher about that? How was that done? How do we do that? Or just holding these smaller independent presses a little bit more like, okay, now we have to up our game because our mm -hmm. good is, our, our wants great is now good. And do we want to be seen as good or do we need to kind of be as great again, right? Like that matte cover sitting in the middle of a Barnes and Noble is a very different aesthetic than a super glossy cover with pristine white pages, which you don't really see outside of independent publishing. And sometimes people have to get that kind of familiar textured book to be like, oh, it's the story inside. Like so much of what mm -hmm. you and I could talk about covers all day in this, yeah. this podcast. <laughs> but that's there is an this, after dark conversation. <laughs> that's a very after dark conversation. But there is this component of sometimes where the harm that comes to us is that we look like less than instead of we were the ones who were doing it first, right? Mm -hmm. There's this idea that like we are not as shiny because we are aged in some way instead of our stories are still new and fresh and important. And how do we make sure that that is conveyed going forward instead of an othering of what one book looks like next to the other one? Yeah, absolutely. Oh man, I feel like I keep going with you on this topic all day, but <laughs> I think people probably want to know what you've been reading or watching. So yeah. what have you been? So, you know, I, I sent you a list of three and now I'm tempted to only focus on one, but I'll shut out the other two. Um, I'm a little late to Starship Q-Star, which is kind of like Star Trek meets Firefly meets the L word in space. Uh, it's a mm. podcast narrative story. A lot of really great voice actors, uh, a couple of actors you may recognize from other projects. So having some fun with that. I feel like it's something that like maybe Finn would really be into, who's one of the Writing Academy professors. I've also been playing Lake. I'm trying cozy games for the first time. I'm very late to the party on this Ooh. genre. So I downloaded Lake and Stardew Valley. And oh, what is the one where you're ferrying people to the afterlife? Anyway, all three of them with the hopes Wayfair? that something would stick. Yes. 
So I didn't something... actually, I haven't played that one, but yeah. Okay. The, I have another one for you then. Cozy Grove. Okay. Cozy Grove. You're okay. A bear. What's Cozy Grove? That's You're a bear. A bear. You're a bear. <laughs> you have little tasks to do in the grove. That's cozy. I, okay. So um, <laughs> you can cut this out, but it, part of my coming out experience, I came out in rural Louisiana. So I came out in a bar in Shreveport. And if you're from that area, you know exactly which one I'm talking about. But I also used to drive to New Orleans and one of the bars I ended up accidentally was a bear bar, not knowing that. Hey! Um, and, <laughs> it's not that kind that, of bear. No, not that kind as of bear. As far as I know. I mean, they don't say, so it's possible, <laughs> but say. I don't know. But I have a huge soft spot. I do not look like a Goldilocks, but the joke was I was one because I was in that space. And yeah, Cute. if you ever want to feel body positive, find a, go into like a gay bear space that you were invited to enter. And I promise like the body positivity that you will experience is just life changing. But I, I, I guess love that. <laughs> yeah. one of the big ones that's sticking with me is I just listened to the audiobook of Here We Go Again by Alison Cochran, which has Natalie Nottis and Jeremy Carlyle Parker sharing their narratives back and forth uh, as the two mains. I love this book. This book did so much for me. Warning that's... here to those who don't want to ha hear heavy, but the premise of this book is that professor that saw you first is passing and these two are mm. responsible for getting him through his dying wishes. Which you're like, oh my God, why would you recommend that? But it is a road trip novel. It is friends to lovers, second chances. There's a lot of forgiveness. Both have their own non-neurotypical journey between ADHD. There's addiction in it. There's OCD. There's like all of these components. And it's done with such a soft hand of forgiveness for who you currently are, as well as permission to embrace all the growth you've done to get to this messiness in your life. It is a love letter to so many different types of people. It also goes through the Grand Canyon. My wife grew up in Arizona and then through the South and up through New England, which has been most of my trajectory, including a joke about Connecticut that had me physically like fall off my bike. Um, <laughs> but, but there is a lot of small love nods, a lot of moments that you're assuming homophobia is going to ensue. And then you remember that there are plenty of queer people in small towns. And you remember that there are plenty of allies and gas stations that you don't feel safe stopping at. And that's not to tell you to stop at that gas station, go with no, your gut no. always. But the shocking parts that happened in the book were never shocking in a way that made me need to stop listening. They were completely counterintuitive and reminded me that there's still some kind of semblance of love and care and community everywhere. Uh, mm -hmm. And even talking about it now, like I didn't really cry reading the book or listening to it, but the aftermath of it, like it's... If you're willing to handle the idea of what that's going to eventually become, I promise you'll see yourself in a way that you need to give yourself permission to see in the journey of experiencing that novel. Ah, uh, that sounds. It's really also a big publisher, so I'm sorry for indies. It just happens to be the most recent one that I engaged with, but yeah. Well, I think I'll, like one of the recommendations that we made when we did the Project 2025 episode was to read queer books, like buy them, review them, get them from the library. And I think we need to absolutely do it for our indies and our small to mid size presses that we love. I think we also actually need to do it for the large presses as well, because it does show them that their investment makes sense. Again, capitalism, baby. Uh, I'm willing so to, I am willing to work the capitalism angle if it helps us continue to have access to the books that we love. So I will also be talking about a book from a large press. But I will be if I can, an indie. Yeah, that's perfect. And my, my last thing for recommendation goes into oh. indies a lot. I, I do want to share like the opening to the book uh, if I can. Oh, Just yeah. this will tell Please you do. if you want to read it or not. And it's yeah. for all the queer educators out there. You save lives simply by showing up. And for every young queer teenager who became a little bit more attached to their English teacher. Mm -hmm. And oh no, I, it's me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, hello. Uh, why why are you being so aggressive with your, your yeah? Your what's opening, up with that? I mean, Allison. Wow. Neither she nor I knew that I was queer at the time, and I don't think she does now either. <laughs> but yeah, absolutely. Fuck. Mrs. McKinnon, she was the best. Holly Stave and Michelle Farley. Michelle Farley in high school and uh, Dr. Holly Stave of Louisiana Scholars College in college. And the way I came out to her is I showed up one week reading. Oh, my God. Showed up one week reading Ruby Fruit. The next week, uh -huh. she reading Oranges Are Not the Only Fruit. 
showed up reading well of loneliness oh boy up reading to the lighthouse she's like you need to talk and I was like yes oh my god I need to talk to someone <laughs> and just like broke down so I very she... much outed myself <laughs> by doing that. amazing did she start with first of all stop reading the well of loneliness <laughs> <It's> better book <laughs> well that's when she finally plucked me she was like willing to let me go <laughs> through Weena Mae Brown and, and Jeanette Winterson but she like saw that I was reading Radcliffe Hall and she's like oh no absolutely yeah. not get in my office so yeah. yeah, that's the one I will admit, like of the, because I think, you know, there are certain books in our like lesbian literary canon. That's one that I haven't read and I forget who told me not to. It was a prominent author. I'd have to dig through the old Les Do books archives, which let's be honest, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> but they were like, no, it's fucking depressing. You don't have to do it. There's so many other better books. And I was like, okay. <laughs> you you can you can uh experience the pain through wiki just read the synopsis if you feel inclined radcliffe hall is not getting restitutions and any type of payment at this point right. so like you're not harding a queer author um if anything reading the censorship case that involved this book is really fascinating about publications coming to the u.s and france so i do highly Ooh. recommend that um it's one of those quintessential queer it's it played into is this grotesque or not should we ban this or not and that story between what england was doing in the u.s the U.S. was kind of the good guys briefly for a moment. Go figure. Whoa. Um, go. Yeah, uh, in the censorship wars. But yeah, you do not read it. need to read Stephen's story. And I don't think it ages well because it probably wasn't actually that great then, to be honest. Mm -hmm. It just, you know, when you live in a world full of men and you write a character who, yeah, I don't even know how to approach this book because like now I have a much more trans knowledgeable lens and they don't mm -hmm. describe all the loneliness that way, but there might be some argument within it. So find somebody a lot smarter than me if you're going to unpack Will of Loneliness. <laughs> well, it's just even without having read it, I do think it's fair to say just because a book is radical doesn't mean that it's good or doesn't mean that it's well written. Just because it's the only piece of me. We see that with films sometimes where we get so excited to finally have sapphic representation. We're like, this, this is the one. And then you watch it. You're like, is it? <laughs> is this the one? <laughs> yeah. I was that perfect person with every DVD from Wolf Media, if you remember that mm. producing company. They did like Loving Annabelle, and I think they did It's in the Water, oh, and okay. Kissing Jessica Stein, and, and mm -hmm. all of those films of yesteryear. And yeah, plenty of movies that, I, I'm not saying any of those movies, I'm not saying yeah or nay, but plenty of movies that were both uh, maybe not good, but also desperately needed, so rewatched yep. a thousand times. Yeah. Understood. But anyway. With all that said, can I kick it back to you and ask what you've been reading, writing, listening Absolutely. to? Absolutely. Drag races, of course. I continue to watch Global All-Stars down to the final four. The finale will be over by the time this airs. And I hate it less, which is great. I've never hated a drag race this much before. I'm like, what the fuck Ooh. is happening? I don't know if they should be doing international versions if the judges don't understand any of the contexts of those countries is just um, where I'll leave it. But the top four, yay, they're great. Whoever wins doesn't matter. <laughs> That's the best versus seasons when you're like, only one person will feel like a win and the rest will feel like yes. the editing team wanted me to hate the winner. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Well, and the the hand of production feels very heavy this season like there are some seasons where like you just you watch it play out and you're like okay so clearly this person is gonna be the winner of the episode and this person is gonna go home and then there's just this like what what is happening i've had that more often than not this season it's been very validating to watch the recap show binge queens on wow presents plus where it has four former contestants two who have actually three three have actually won on different series and it's just like a watching them watch the show. And it's been very oh. entertaining to what see is them. The binge queen. Binge queens. Oh my God. So it's on Wow Presents Plus. It's okay. yeah, like I said, it's it's basically a recap show or like a reaction show. Oh. Um, and so they're doing it for Global All Stars. Previous to that, they did it for Drag Race UK, Canada's Drag Race, any of the like Canada or UK versus the world. They did okay. it for Mexico season one for some reason. I don't understand what gets a binge queens and what doesn't get a binge queens, to be honest. But this I season- I that was almost like binging like a telenovela. That sounds fascinating. Well, that would also be fun. But no, yeah. it's not that. It's- it's. Oh, I just meant like reacting to um, RuPaul Mexico, like the, the oh. kind of energy there. Yeah, that so. would- 
probably be better. So yeah, I don't know. Global All Stars is nearly over. I can't wait. <laughs> but then Drag Race UK is still going. It's still good. Holy shit. I think it's the best drag race season of like any region that I've seen in probably at least a few years. Whoa. It's so good. So even if you've never watched UK before, just jump in on this one. It's fabulous. And I've been watching okay. cooking competition show because I really love, I love cooking competition shows that follow a cohort of people from beginning to end. So like Great British Bake Off, can, uh, mm -hmm. Great Canadian Bake Off is fantastic. This one's called Culinary Class Wars. It's out of Korea. Have you seen it? Uh, yeah, we're like deep in it right now. Okay, so. I'm in the middle of it too. Okay, so to set it up for people who haven't seen it yet, it's basically Physical 100 with chefs. Based on the title, I thought it was going to be cooking classes that were competing against each other. And it's like, no, they actually decided to like tier the chefs as if they were social classes. So you have 20 elite chefs. They're the white coats or jackets, whatever you call those chef mm -hmm. top coat, whatever. It doesn't yeah. matter. And then there's 80 who are not. And so the first few episodes is like whittling it down to 20 who are going to go head to head against. So it's like 20 and 20 black coats, white coats. And it's so weird, like with the with the the black jacket chefs. I was like, you only get to go by your nickname until you prove yourself and then you can use your real name. And I'm like, holy shit, what, what, what are we doing? But I'm in the section now where it is the head to head and it's very good. Ooh. I like it very much. We just started. So yeah, it's good to hear to, to keep steady and keep going. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'm loving that one. I'm also playing a mostly chill game. It's called Dave the Diver. You play Dave. You don't get to like, it's not one where you set up a character. Like you mm -hmm. are Dave and you are at some cove where there is a sushi restaurant and you have to dive and you have to collect a fish for the sushi restaurant. And then you also help run the sushi restaurant. And when I say it's mostly chill, it's because uh, it's much less chill when Dave gets bitten by a shark and you're like, holy shit. And trying to click buttons to be unbitten by. Didn't sometimes. you just call this a cozy game? It's a mostly cozy game. It's a cozy game with sharks that can bite you. <laughs> okay. Okay. You know, real world coziness. You could be enjoying your tea and your book, but something's still there. Yep. There are times you. when Neil's like, are you okay? And I'm like, I got bit by a shark. <laughs> um, were you ever subjected to typer shark when you were younger or in I college? Like the, it's the so. accuracy testing, like typing test that they used to give some of us in typing classes. And you would oh. get bitten by a shark, like it, when you made too many errors with your speed test and nope. typing. So, yeah. No, nope, that doesn't make sense. But I can still tell you the mnemonics I learned to touch type when I was in high school. Yeah. Yeah, we had we had a typing class in high school. Quick, ask Zoe what stops X rays. Even dogs can't. I'm not going to go all the way through. Oh my God, you really can do it down the QWERTY board. I'm like looking at my board in real time as you said that. That's yeah. We did not learn that says a lot about the small Southern school I went to. We had typewriter typewriters and we would uh -huh. pop out. This is so horrible in hindsight. We would pop out the spring that would allow the buttons to go up and down. So we only had like five operating typewriters in the class for 15. Oh, so no. you only went to class like every three days and you just got to go to both lunches because the school couldn't figure out how to make them work or replace them because we were uh, horrible teenagers in the 90s who wanted to not do work. Yeah. But yeah, which really was the same spring that's like in a ballpoint pen. It's really stupid in hindsight. But yeah, no, I, I very different. Like, uh, I'm like, hey, okay. Yeah. Kudos yeah. to you for knowing the mnemonic. Yeah. That was the just drilling day in and day out in grade nine that <laughs> made us do it. And for whatever reason, I took to it. Also hilarious. The woman who taught that class was teaching there when my mom went to that high school. So she went from teaching on typewriters to teaching on computers. Yeah, we had typewriters because our school was poor, but the, like in theory, everybody was using computers <laughs> that, yeah. at that juncture. Yeah, um, yeah. I don't remember goodness. that teacher's name. She was not my favorite. And then I read, okay, so I also read a Christmas slash Hanukkah, but mostly Christmas romance called Make My Wish Come True by Rachel Lippincott and Allison Derrick. I think it's so cute that they're married to each other and they write books together. And so like when I was reading the acknowledgements, how they thank each other, that's how I found out because it's the first book I've read with both of them. And I was like, come on, you two are adorable. <laughs> um, part of me cannot believe that I'm already talking about holiday romances before Halloween 
because last year it was really hard to find two books. Like I try to talk about like, what are the holiday romances coming out this year? Last year, it was a struggle to find two. And thankfully I did. But like, oh, okay, this year is the year that everybody's doing a Christmas book, I think. Like, it's kind of wild. So this one's super cute. Does it count as YA if the characters are 18? Yeah, I don't, because I feel that way about their other books too. Like, is it, it's new adult then, right? If you're well, 18 Well, one of them's 20... still in high school. Yeah, I don't know. Again, I'm not, the, you're the smarter one of the two of us in this conversation. Okay, then I'm going to say this is a very cute small town, celebrity, former friends to lovers, Maybe YA rom com. <laughs> YA asterisk, is it? We don't know. And so the two leads are Caroline Beckett and Arden James. They were glued at the hip when they were growing up. They were absolutely each other's person until the day when Arden was 14 and her parents moved their family to LA. Caroline never heard from her again. Also, neither did Arden's grandmother, which I think is not okay because I fucking love her grandmother. I would die for that character. Arden became a famous actor, but at this point she's known kind of more for, and like Netflix famous, not to say that that's not famous, but you know what I mean? There's kind of tearing, but she, at this point she's really known more for her partying. So when you think like Lindsay Lohan's messy partying okay. time, kind of more like that, but there's this role that she wants to get. It's with like an indie film, indie director, and it could like change her life type of role. And she wants it, you know, about a small town girl. She was a small town girl. She crushes the audition. And at the end of it, the director said, this was the best audition we've had. And I can't give you this part because of who you are. And so her publicist comes up with this beyond bonkers lie and says, she's not a party girl. The publicist, by the way, who was the one who said, you need to do this party girl thing so you can get more raw roles, which was not, you know, the case. And she's like, no, no, no. No, Arden's not a party girl. She's actually quite serious. She has a long-term girlfriend back in her hometown. Her name's Caroline. The very Caroline trope. that uh. she hasn't talked about in four years. So yes, I should have said also fake relationship. I know I love fake relationships too. It's my, uh, my catnips are celebrities, fake relationships, and ice queens. And this got two out of three, which is pretty great. So of course the problem with this plan because there's this whole like not only does she have a long-term girlfriend but like she can prove it she's going back home for the holidays to which there was this like i'm what oh fuck okay i guess i'm going back to the holidays and so she shows up and just is like hey hey i really need your help and caroline's like fuck you because of course like you disappeared you've been gone for four years you never not a text not a call not a visit not a are you insane like what and Caroline wants to be a journalist, though. So Arden says, listen, there's 12 days until Christmas. What if we do 12 dates in 12 days and you can write the article that's going to go into Cosmopolitan magazine about this? This will help with your application packages for college. So Caroline's like, fine, I fucking hate you, but I'm going to do this anyway. This book was exactly as cute as I hoped it was going to be. I really loved it. The small town vibes are so good in this one. The 12 dates, some of them are hilarious. Some of them are sweet. It just like, it's really easy to picture this as a film or a mini series because there's 12 dates. I kind of hope it would be more in the like mini series realm, like make it a heart stopper season length situation. I really like that with this one, the perspective shifts between the two leads because we get to see we get to see the feelings change for both of them as we go. We get to understand how had they felt about each other when they were 14? What had been going on? What's it bringing back up to the surface? And that chemistry is really great. And I also like that it shows that like being ghosted by a best friend, like we, we talk about romantic relationships as being the hardest thing ever in our society when actually friendship breakups can be as hard or harder, depending on who they are, the circumstances under which they happen. And it's kind of easy to write it off as like, well, but they were 14. And it's like, yeah, and that's when the feelings are the strongest and it's the hardest. And trying to make space for this person in your life again, when you're starting to negotiate, what is my life as an adult going to be? I thought it was handled really, really well. 
probably not super surprisingly, Arden has the biggest arc of the two. I don't think Caroline has a particularly big arc and she doesn't need to. I don't think that's always necessary in a book, but she has to answer the question of like, okay, what do I actually want out of my life? What do I want to do? What's important to me? Side characters are fabulous. Caroline has a ton of, you know, her friends and family and her friends get like good airtime on this. And it's just lovely. And Arden's grandmother, like I said, I would die for her. She's wonderful. I love her. And so I think with this one, it has a highly optimistic happy for now. And I think that's exactly the right way to go with characters who are 18. Because to have 18 year olds where you just have full conviction that like, and they are together for the rest of their lives. And it's like, mm, who you are at 18 is not who you are at 23, let alone who you are at 53 <laughs> or whatever. So. Yeah. I've been told one of my toxic traits is that I don't need an HEA and I don't need an epilogue. So, um, well, I don't need a happily ever after, but it, you can't call it a romance if it doesn't have an optimistic ending. And I will yes, die on that. I, too. Yes. Fully concur. And I think an optimistic ending or a, it's good now. And we're, we're working towards continuing goodness yes. going forward is very sincere. Yes. I, I always think it's funny when people call me ni nice because my deep down it's a cynic heart you know like i'm always cautious mm. and apprehensive but uh yeah my toxic trait is a exactly that especially with younger characters of like kind of that pressure that if we were to see these characters appear in another book that took place five years later and they were still perfectly pristine in their honeymoon phase i'd be like okay that might actually have killed the first book for me because mm. now they stop kind of being human relatable people so yes. yeah i think that's a very helpful thing to do for younger people like i wish them continued happiness and many hanukkahs and christmases but you know it's being a human's messy it's a, that's okay it's okay yeah <laughs> it's when we're like i could imagine it picks up in 10 years and maybe they're together in that like very settled state or maybe they're just best friends like it would kind of love that too either way yeah i have one complaint okay and is that the title is almost exactly the same as the Christmas romance from Angela Burks that came out last year. <laughs> and so I keep trying to tell people, I read this book. It's really great. It's either called Make Her Wish Come True or Make Your Wish Come True. And it turns out I was wrong because it's called Make My Wish Come True. <laughs> you and I did this in a text message. I was like, wait, mm -hmm. is it this one? Wait, is it that one? Like, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, it's fine. And I get it. In the case of this book and Angela's book, the title is highly relevant to the events of the book because make my wish come true. Well, that's Arden. Arden is saying, can you make my wish come true by pretending to be my girlfriend and therefore I can get this role? In the case of Angela's, make her wish come true. Can we get a new mommy, a new second mommy for this sweet little girl who wrote a letter to Santa? Very cute. It just means I'm going to fuck it up every time when I'm recommending books to people. And I'm like, the one that just look for, just look for... Just look for wish come true and then throw lip and cot in the in the description in Google and then you'll find the right book. So oh, that's me being picky and mildly annoyed because I've been having a hard time recommending this accurately to people because ADHD brain. But I honestly think this is one that I would come back to. Like if I was saying like, oh, what are some Christmas romances I really enjoyed and I want to read again? This would definitely go on that list. That's how much I enjoyed it. So, okay, yeah. And then it sounds like the Brooks one. Just to, oh, yes. since we're getting in that, that is like almost a miracle on 34th street S kind of. So I recommended it last year and I haven't read it since then, but it's a fake relationship romance. Okay. And there, so this little girl basically says that like for Christmas, she wants another mom. And so it's somebody who actually wants to also be a journalist. Oh, oh so story. almost like sleepless in Seattle vibes of like the kid calling into the radio station for his dad or whatever. So kind of kind of like okay. that. I'm just finding the blurb. Angela, I'm so sorry if you listen to this. You know I loved your book. I just haven't read it in almost a year. I'm so sorry. So... I put Tara on the on the no, 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 no. button. Uh, I apologize for that. No, it's okay. So one of the leads wants to be a reporter. She hasn't been able to do it yet, despite having like the right credentials and her. I think it's like her best friend at work, I guess you could say. Somebody that she went through the journalism program with says, okay, can you fake date this woman for a story about finding love and I'll give you a co-writing credit? Mm -hmm. And it happened. the other woman happens to be a single mom and she's like, I haven't dated in a long time. Like I, I need to put all my focus on this kid. 
I don't, I don't know, but we have this good click and they do actually have a good click. And yeah, it's just, it was a really, really cute one. I enjoyed it very much. And it wasn't one where the fake dating, because one of them knows they're fake dating and one of them doesn't, it actually oh. doesn't drag on. I was so afraid it was going to be one of those books where like you get to the 70% mark and then there's the, you betrayed me. And it's like, nope, not like that. Thankfully, not like that at all. Um, she comes clean. Not on the first date, but she comes clean like fairly early on. Early on enough that like I still felt very comfortable with it. So if that's a hesitation for anybody, it's definitely worth checking out anyway. Good to know. Yeah, I'll yeah. definitely do it. I, I'm a sucker for a holiday, like stack of books, you know. Yeah. Tis hygge season, as they say in Denmark. So. so you can read Make Her and My Wish Come True by two <laughs> different sets of authors. <laughs> Uh, a twofer that's right all right Bex what is your official recommendation this week you know you and I talked off pod about this because I, there's a plethora of actual like tangible things that I could tell people to go seek out and please talk to me I'd love to like talk specifically with people about that but I think really mine is more of a call to action and flash positivity and what I mean by that is not like inauthentic kindness but if there's something that like really freaking excites you, something that like you can't stop thinking about or something that you wish you had a community to digest this with or something that you want more of this from an author, say something semi-kind in a post or to the author or in an email or whichever. I find that it's so easy to compound on joy and excitement. And right now there's just so much going on where all of us are kind of collectively working very hard and holding our breath that the permission to still find joy in those little moments and share that joy to me is the most pivotal thing right now. And by no means am I saying like, go blow smoke up somebody's derriere. But honestly, like even just now with this conversation, I'm like, oh, wait, you just mentioned Brooks. Can you tell me a little bit more? Those yes and conversations are my recommendation for the next, what is today? Uh, <laughs> so we're less than a month away from the election here in the US. I, I need more of that. And we need more of that because if it goes the way that many of us want it to go, Yes, let's keep compounding and driving that. And if for any reason anything was to go differently, we need as much momentum as possible. And the more we can feed each other with that kind of like drive in enthusiasm, the more likely we are, no matter the outcome, to be okay. Plus, I, you know, I am doing outreach and the more I see where other people are excited, the easier it is for my job. So there's some altruism in there too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I appreciate everybody's help. So what would you say to people who think, well, that's a really great idea, but it makes me uncomfortable. What are some like quick, easy ways they could get started and see that actually it's not that scary? There's a lot of stuff you can do that like doesn't really require you to talk. Um, I know that some places that review now require you to like leave an actual review besides just the star count. Do that five star and then in the review, just go see star count. Like you can just tell people to look back up and see that you gave it five. And that's not people asking you for more information from you. Talking to your peer group about things that excite you that's never posted publicly is super powerful. Investing some extra hours in that indie game that you like so those producers see that data and they're able to go like, hey, we have an invested audience. Let's do some more patches and some more mods. All of that feeds into a positive system of creation. So find whatever brings you the most joy and lean in where you would naturally feel most comfortable and then expand upon it as you feel comfortable. What are some of your favorites? I have not done them in the last few weeks because I'm in Q4 and in my world, that means no sleep. But mm -hmm. <laughs> I do believe in a, a, a group of friends and I have a thing called Shout Out Friday where the only thing we do that day is the only post we will publicly make is positive posts about things that get us excited. I text you and Brenna, I'm like, hey, I have nothing important to say, but I just want to say I appreciate y'all because who the mm -hmm. heck knows how that goes. My wife and I will go for a walk and each take one podcast, like one ear and listen to a podcast together and then digest it. For me, it's just actively kind of being present in things that I'm consuming because they're fun to consume. So when we mm -hmm. talk about where we are within this community and the commonality of the things we do, for me, it's actively pursuing things that I know I'll like. There's six other days in the week to pursue things that I should try. So, yeah. You know. What about you? Oh, yeah. What are my... Well... I mean, you do this also professionally. So like as somebody who does this professionally and kind of your reviews are held at a different caliber than let's say I just give, you know, a five-star whatever promotion towards something. Is there joy or how do you find joy in promoting things that excite you? Part of what was really exciting for me in becoming a professional reviewer was finally having a direction 
to send those excited feelings that come or whatever feelings really come up when I finish a book that I care about. Because if it's a book I hate, I'm not going to write a review unless I actually think there's representation that's harmful. I've only done that once. I'm not going to call it out because I don't want to call like attention to the book right now. Because I would get to the end of a book and I would have all these feelings and say, well, what now? And I would just have to like mm -hmm. let it naturally dissipate. And I don't have to do that anymore. So that was always a great thing. And, you know, I always wanted book friends when I was growing up and I never quite had them. I mean, I will probably never again read at the pace at which I was reading in high school, but I was reading 300 books a year in high school. And I had nobody in my life that was ex excited about books as I was. And so in a way, you know, my Google Docs became my book friend. <laughs> where I could direct some of that. But I think, you know, I also bring a couple of other things with me as a reviewer that means it's not just about the joy. Like I get to do a little bit of, sometimes I'm self-indulgent. We'll do a little bit of literary analysis because that is my background as a literature major. And also, you know, I said before, I'm a product marketer. And so as a product marketer, like I'm having to create sales tools all the time for people I work with. I fundamentally believe that what I bring as a reviewer is that I'm also helping create sales tools. I am helping people who read them to make a purchasing decision or not. I feel like that's kind of my, somebody, I don't think it was you. I think it might've been Jade asked if I wanted to be on the board of GCLS. And I said, absolutely not. Because if I did that, I wouldn't have time to review. Also people every so often, I think Chris every so often is like, when are you going to write a book? And I'm just like, I'm not going to write a book. <laughs> but first of all, I don't want to. I have no stories. And second of all, if I start writing, I'm going to stop reading. I'm going to stop reviewing. And so I think some of it is about, it's not even about joy. It's about mission for me. Like it just feels vitally important. And of course there is joy to it or I, I wouldn't be doing it. If it felt like work all the time, I, I wouldn't do it. There's no money in it. <laughs> Why would I devote that much of my time if it's not fun? But yeah, I mean, I think that's where when I stopped doing Let's Do Books, which if people aren't familiar, it was on the Lesbian Reviews podcast network and it was author interviews. And Chris and I later that year planned out and, and we launched the following January Queerly Recommended. And I think it was, this is the format that I was comfortable with landing on if I was going to keep doing podcasting because it's kind of part of that Im importance of connecting people to the books or other queer media that is important and that might help them either find themselves or affirm themselves or whatever it's going to be. I mean, I talked about this on our reviewer panel. I mean, that's still why I do it today, but even more important is this mission of how do we continue to have access to our literature? Again, I think I said this in the Project 2025 one, but as a Canadian, it's felt incredibly frustrating to know that the bulk of queer representation in literature comes out of the United States. And I cannot influence the election in the United States, nor should I. I don't want anybody influencing Canadian elections. And I was sitting there kind of like grumbling and what can, what can, but what can I do? Surely I must be able to do something. I was like, oh, wait, I do have a platform. Like it's not, it's not massive. It's not the most of the U.S. electorate, but, you know, we have a passionate following of people who stick with us episode after episode. And all of the folks who listen have people in their lives that they talk to. And like, if we can present information and they can share it with those people, or if we can present recommendations of things that we love and they can share it with the people in their lives that might also love it. Like that's, that's important. And that's where the pebble ripple, you know, those cheesy metaphors, they're cheesy, but they're still kind of true. So I think there's that. And then I think also in my friendships, it's important to make sure that people understand that they're important to me, that I care about them. Some of it I do through like meme pebbling of like, hey, I saw this and it made me think of you. <laughs> you. In some cases, it's just like flat out telling my friends that I love them, which was really difficult to do for a long time. And then I became friends with a guy named Spencer and he's awesome. And he was the friend who he's, he makes sure his friends knows that he loves them. And having grown up in that like deeply religious space, it was, I was like, whoa, wait, this man is telling me that he loves me. And it's like, no, like he helped me unlearn some of that, that it's okay to express your love as long as you're clear, like what that love actually means. So yeah, that's my, 
I think I went on a long tangent, but hopefully that answers no. your question. <laughs> I, I don't think you went on a long tangent. That's what that no is. I do have an odd way of thinking of like, if you can't write books, then you can't read. But I'd like to position it back to you a little bit differently. I think you are like a walking nonfiction version of Choose Your Own Adventure talking to you. And the reason being is you're so knowledgeable that depending on the conversation and the superpower of your ADHD brain, no matter when I'm having a conversation with you, there can be three things it could tangent into, but each is yes. going to be really robust. So I always win no matter <laughs> which way the tangent goes. And I think that that is a crazy huge superpower. And it's like this walking encyclopedia I can't get enough of. So yeah, oh, maybe you're you. not writing a book, but you're a, you're a walking living like embodiment yeah. of a tome to the love of this genre and, and these voices. So thank you. And I just don't want to. <laughs> like, I don't want to write a book. Like <laughs> it seems like it's really hard work and it takes a lot of time and I have to learn how to do it. There's like, there's people who assume just like, if you've read, like, yeah, I've probably read over a thousand books in our, in our sector. That doesn't mean I know how to do it. I can eat a thousand meals. I can eat a thousand Indian dishes. I don't know how to cook Indian food. Like it doesn't mean I can't learn. I could probably learn how to write a book, but nothing about the idea gives me dopamine, <laughs> which is how ADHD brains are motivated. In fact, the idea of it feels like a drain versus like, hey, look at this book over here. It has ice queens and a fake relationship. And I'm like, fuck yes. With yes. You. Make it a slow burn and I'm fully there. Um, right? A oh. tangent off of yours. I I realize the amount of privilege about to come out of my mouth. So just caveat yep. there of like, I have a master's and like, that is a privilege unto itself. And I'm no, the first same. person in my family to go to college and like all of these things. But I went to a creative writing master's program as a non-creative writer. I was strictly mm -hmm. there as a researcher. <laughs> So That's I was surrounded cool. by nothing but these phenomenal playwrights. And I was like, yeah, I'll just do whatever research you need for your production, which was the best way to learn the craft without doing the craft. But I can also tell you, even with that degree, I still don't have any freaking idea how to do mm -hmm. any of that because that's just the start to finish. I, you know, they say write messy, edit, you know, mm -hmm. later. I, I think about everything in real time of like, okay, if this is what you're doing in, in act one, then how do you mark it so you don't get anything away for act three, but also how do you get people to come back from intermission and how do you get them hungry enough that they're buying mm -hmm. stuff for concessions mm -hmm. and like, I can't yes. get out of the, the consumption part of writing. So consuming it is much more tangible for me than producing it. Mm -hmm. I get it. Yeah. I'm with I you. Get it. I'm with you. Well, that was a pretty cool recommendation. I like it. Yeah. Well, and then I don't have anything on my Kindle or my bookcase for this week that is like top priority. So I'm hoping you can make a recommendation for me to move into that slot. Yes, I can. So cool, cool. we are recording this on the 13th. So in two days, you will be able to purchase this book. And for everybody listening, you can now purchase this book. I'm recommending Reverence by Milena Mackay, which is probably not a huge surprise. She's been promoting it, the launch all over, and people know that I've really loved some of her books, especially The Headmistress. This one is quite different. So the angst, I would say it's about comparable or a little bit more than The Headmistress, way less than A Whisper of Solace, which I could not finish because I am a baby and it was just... It was it was it was a little much for me, and that's okay. So reverence, though, takes place in the world of 1980s elite ballet. Juliet is the well. There's two leads, of course. It is it is a romance, but everything is told from the perspective of Juliet. She is a prima ballerina at the Paris Ballet. She's originally American. She studied in the UK, but she's been working in Paris for um, many years. The story starts with their company being in the middle of a visit from the Bolshoi in Russia. And Katerina is their prima who they've brought along. Katerina keeps very much to herself. She doesn't really talk to anyone. And we see her slap one of the, the Paris ones who, uh, one of the Paris ballet guys who basically tries to touch her and like, she draws blood, which is kind of appropriate for her and is kind of telling. So Katerina, like I said, she very much keeps to herself, but also there is this like asshole from the KGB. There's a KGB agent 
who is basically glued to her side. He is there as it feels like he's supposed to be kind of a bodyguard, except we see a couple of moments where he is not treating her well either. And so she keeps to herself, but he keeps people away from her as well. Like you can tell there's just this extreme isolation. And then one night at a party, Katarina corners, like there's an opportunity where they're, they're together just to two of them. And she says, I want to defect. And so that of course becomes a huge story that the best ballerina from the Bolshoi is defecting and wants to live in France. And, you know, there's turmoil kind of there. Juliet makes a bargain with a minister in the French government, basically makes a deal with the devil so that Katerina can defect because she can see she's not okay. It would be wrong for me to not help her out with this. The ballet company doesn't even have any apartments open for her. So Juliet offers, she opens her home and offers her spare room to Katerina. They are around each other all the time. And Katerina doesn't talk to her. She barely talks to anybody for like this first half of the book. And so we see Juliet is deeply attracted to her. She is an out lesbian because, you know, because she is a part of the world of ballet, it's a little more okay to be out and queer because it's like, well, you're in the arts and whatever, who cares that, you know, she got this title. Like she's not just a prima ballerina, but she gets the title of Asaluda, which I think just means like absolute best of the best. It's something that is very rarely given out. It was given by the president of the country. And she feels like Katarina maybe doesn't approve of her being a lesbian until, of course, you know, it turns out that that's not the case at all and the romance unfolds from there like i said there is some angst i wouldn't say it's over the top but also with most of the romance i've been reading in the last year it feels rare because there's really not most of the time anymore like do you remember it probably is more than five years ago where there would be angst all the time and there's like Mm -hmm. yeah I don't know where it went and COVID. Oh yeah. Okay. Fuck. Oh, do you think that's what happened? COVID happened and it was like, everybody just needs, I hope I didn't call out too many. Like this book was like a warm hug and it's exactly what I needed. Like we need warm hugs, but I think sometimes we also need to feel like those deep feelings and this book delivers. In our small circle, being my wife and I, we have a lot of conversations um, because she very much wants the like non angst. I went through that. We were in lockdown. I still have my thing. And I like Mm -hmm. angst because it's where people give themselves permission to be the messiest. Like Mm -hmm. you unfold like the whys instead of in the house. But yeah, Mm -hmm. I said that with such conviction as if I have the data to support it. I don't, but I would be really interested if we were to look at like the books that were the most embraced for a time being and see pre COVID versus post COVID and see how comfortable many of us are sitting in like long (laughs) weeks and months of kind of existential crises. That's interesting. I mean, I don't believe in angst for the sake of angst. Mm -hmm. And there are some books where it works incredibly. And there's some books where it doesn't work as well. Like I will remember until the day I die, the way I felt when I read the twist, which was entirely angst driven in the Goodman's by Claire Ashton. Did you ever read that? No. (gasps) It's an orange cover, right? Yes. Black silhouette. I'm sorry to refer to it by its cover. No, I haven't read it because I always end up confusing that cover with finding Jessica Lambert or whichever, but yeah. Yeah, that's not the same. Yeah, that's not the same. So that book is incredible. There's two Mm -hmm. romances in it. There's a big, there is a big twist in the middle that I did not see coming. And I actually think even with having said there's a twist, I cannot imagine somebody figuring it out ahead of time. It's just so powerfully done. So if you, anybody who hasn't read that yet, definitely recommend. But with this one, it's very interesting because on the one hand, I want to talk about the romance. And on the other hand, I want to talk about why I think this is a really important book. And I'm sort of torn about which to do (laughs) first. So I'm here for both conversations. I'm also intrigued because we're talking about an author who has like such a first beloved novel that I don't envy every novel that then comes after The Headmistress because it's put into such a bucket that like everything then gets compared to it. So I think about this frequently with, you know, those books we all hold really dear that happened early in an author's creative life because almost like they end up being their own enemy the whole time against it. So what's interesting is, and do not beat yourself up over this, that's not her first book. 
That's her second book. So her first book was The Delicate Things We Make. And I actually think in some ways- Which I, that's helpful to hear because I definitely read it after. So maybe in my head, I made it. Oh yeah, yeah. I think so that's that, probably you. exactly what happened. So in some ways, actually, when I get to why I think this is an important book, I will probably touch on The Delicate Things We Make. And I'm calling this out now so that if I forget, maybe you'll remember. So the romance for this- it was, I don't think I've read anything quite like it before. So it is an ice queen romance. I think the author only writes ice queen romances, but in the case of Katerina, it takes a long time for us to figure out why doesn't she talk to anybody? Like she'll say little things here and there. We see little smiles starting to come out here and there, or maybe a little joke. And so we see her revealed very, very slowly. And some of that not even some of that. A lot of that is because we're only seeing her through Juliet's eyes. And so because we're only mm -hmm. seeing her through Juliet's eyes, you know, we don't get any of her interiority unless or until she starts to share some of that. And when she does, it's fabulous. But she's incredibly protective of what she lets out and who she lets in. And so much of that is because of what she experienced at the hands of the KGB. And you know, I'm 45. And so I'm just, I'm old enough that I remember the USSR existing. I don't really remember it when it fell apart, but I do remember stories, not that I could point to any specific names, but I remember hearing about like, say Olympians defecting, mm -hmm. which I think is still a thing that happens sometimes. But like, I remember it being a very big deal in the 80s. And you hear things about like how grueling it was for Russian athletes compared to some of the other athletes. Like, yeah, if you're an Olympian, it's grueling, but it's like this whole other level of control. So I finished it last night, but I started it earlier this week. And so we, you know, I got to some of that, her story earlier this week and just going, huh, I don't think I've ever seen before government treatment leading to an ice queen. Typically I'm more used to, well, this is you know, my parents did something or this is what I have to do to make it in a male dominated industry or you and I even started this conversation at GCLS. Is she an ice queen or is she autistic? Because sometimes that that can be a bit of an element. May I ask there. another question on top of what you're yeah, discussing with do. the government? Yeah. You're, you express like, you know, you've seen like outside factors and or, you know, we talk all the time about those who are somewhere on a spectrum in the boxes they're placed in versus mm -hmm. their authentic diagnoses and where they can exist. Yeah. I hear you saying you've never seen a government before, but I feel like in your podcast, I've heard you express that you've seen the church in some capacity lead to an ice queen. Does the church yes. get a different permission than a government does, especially in countries where the church has such power? That's an interesting question. I mean... And I broach mm. that carefully not to be offensive no, no, to no, anybody's no. like religious no, practice, but like well, the, the government thing intrigues me as well. Yeah. I mean, major caveat, I don't know a lot about Russia and I don't know a lot about Soviet Russia in the 1980s. And that was going to be my next question is like how much, how accessible is it with the limited knowledgeable, like you and I are in our forties. So the USSR was a lifetime thing, but to many readers, it may have always yeah. been just Russia. Hmm. I do think it's fairly accessible to your question of, is it different when it's a church? It probably depends on what era that it's written in, because there mm -hmm. are certain countries where the church and the government were one. And, but I don't think I've read it. And Russia is very different. That's like crazy complex when it comes to like, I'm not even going to try to touch that one. But. Yeah. Like, I don't think, I don't think the church was a big factor there as far as I know, but I mean, same as you said, like apologies to anybody if I'm if I'm totally wrong about it. I'm just I mean, thinking more like government and control entities. And again, not to call religion controlling, but some who use religion as permission to control. So like kind of when I think about like entry points as a reader, what people project yeah. into it based on their own understanding of complexities. If America's the largest producer, sadly, I don't know, maybe we don't hold our government accountable in the same way all the time. So it gets bestowed upon a different controlling entity. So. Yeah. So I think there's similarities in the sense of was this identity forged in an authoritarian environment? And I mm -hmm. would say that, you know, I'll only draw from my experience growing up in a Baptist church. It, it was it was an authoritarian government. There were social consequences for things. You know, I saw some pretty vicious things said about girls in my peer group who there were a couple who ended up pregnant outside of wedlock. 
but it's, I would say in this case, it's very different because the Russian government had the gulag. And so it was like, if you were, if you were an intellectual, if you were saying or doing things that they thought was offside, they would just whisk you away and there you go and you could be executed and you could be. So that's where I do think there's a difference between religion and certain governments and specifically this government. Oh man. It's it, so this book is really hard to t- like, it's really hard to talk about the relationship without getting into spoilers. And I don't want to spoil it for anyone because I think there's something quite special and beautiful that's happening here. I believed in their relationship. I think what was interesting is because Juliet wasn't sure the chemistry just feels a little differently. It feels a little different than some others that I've read, including by this author, because it is this, like, it's the 1980s. It's not nearly as widely accepted to be queer as it is now. She doesn't have an insight into what's happening with Katerina's mind until she does, which takes about half of the book. But I think what we get instead of very clear overt chemistry is a sense of longing and frustration. And I think that actually also works very well. And then once they get together, their chemistry is very good. And I felt that in my body. Like, I think that's something that it doesn't happen very often that like, as I'm reading a book, like I'm feeling those emotions in my, in my body, I can point to a handful of them. I mean, the Goodmans I already mentioned also a ballet romance with the music in the mirror by Lola Keeley was another one like where you just feel like that passion is just there and you it's this like visceral experience as you're reading and so that was something that I got with this which also sets it apart from many of the books that I've read I mean also truth and measure of course Mm -hmm. I mean my book that I'll talk about all the time like I feel like because it does that for me, it gets like a special extra little check from me. But I really want to talk most about why I think this is a deeply important book. All queer romance is important. All queer romance is political. It has been political all, all along. And even though our stories aren't all about coming out anymore and the, and the adversity of coming out And that's actually not what this book is about either. They don't need to be because as times have changed, we've been able to change the types of stories that are beloved in our sector. But this is absolutely an inherently political book with a political point of view that is not just specifically to having a joyful representation of queer people on the page. And that's where to go back to the delicate things we make what really stood out with me with that book, yes, there is a romance. Yes, it's beautifully written. Very interesting story, love the characters, but it directly connected to the Me Too movement and Harvey Mm -hmm. Weinstein and some of those stories. And so for me, that's um, when I talk about having like some kind of an overt political is important. So, you know, we have a history of this with this author. With this particular book, because it takes place in the 1980s, because it takes place, most of it takes place before the breakup of the Soviet Union, it really gives that view into how bad it could be and how bad it was for some families. And I would not say it's it's not overdone. It's not over the top. It's not grotesque. As I was reading it, I was like, I don't know enough about this to have any sense of accurate not accurate and i got to the afterward and learned that this was personal you know these are things that happened in her, in her family and the thing that was called out that i think was really important is that this is not just historic these types of things are happening again i think the timing of this release is also incredible and important and i have no idea if it's deliberate when I recommend a book on this show, I never talk to the author before. I like I might get the file from them. That's it. I won't talk to them until after I've recorded, if at all. But a part of me wonders if it's being released now because of the impact. Like when you look at the timing with the U.S. election, it's either the most serendipitous thing of all time <laughs> in publishing for me or it's 
you know, deliberate, like Will and Harper being released as a documentary shortly before the election. Because they had a fight for that too. Did you hear about that? Chris they was a, talking like, about it. Yeah. yeah, they had a petition Netflix for that opportunity. So this book is set in the past, but sometimes we have to see stories that are set in the past to be able to come to certain conclusions in our present. And we learn through Katerina's story and what happened to her family, some of the atrocities that happened under, you know, with the gulag system, with the KGB. And look at where we are today. This might be a personal story that she was telling. And I'm so glad she did. I think she did something incredibly powerful, but also like, look at where we're at with this U S election. We know that one of the U S presidential candidates is not just aligned, but collaborating with the current president of Russia. He, it recently came out, you know, he sent COVID tests to Putin when people, when American citizens couldn't get COVID tests. He has been on the phone with him seven times since leaving the White House. Like he is collaborating with Putin. That is the general consensus. Putin is former KGB. And we know that there are MAGA Republicans who are running for re-election or who will be in the next one after that, who are sharing talking points that have been developed by the Russian government. So to release this story that shows how terrible things were for regular Russian citizens, as well as even very prominent Russian citizens who were under the thumb of their government. What do we think is going to happen if Trump gets in again? Now, is it going to be exactly like the events of this book? Of course not, you know, different time, different things, but the consequences are real and they need to be taken seriously. And you and I were talking, I was, I was giving you a little more of my, like the stuff I'm not going to say on here because I don't want to spoil things for anybody. But I talked a little bit about this aspect and you said, but do you think this is going to change the mind of anybody in our community? And I said, probably not. I have to think the people who listen to this podcast and generally speaking, the people who are reading our, our fiction for the most part are not going to write, not going to vote for, you know, the convicted felon, but we all have people in our family. We all have people in our friend group who may not be aware of how dire certain things are going to get. I saw a headline I didn't click through and I probably should have. So major caveat, this is me saying a headline that I saw on a social media site, not an article that I clicked through to read, but about they're talking about deporting more immigrants if Trump gets in again. And Vance was talking about expanding the definition of legal versus illegal. So people who immigrated legally might also be deported. Like, okay, so now I'm talking about the U.S. government a bunch, but I'm supposed to be recommending a book. I think this book is a beautiful romance and it had a good amount of angst, but not too much. And it made me deeply feel emotions in my body in a way that doesn't happen often. And I think you can also draw a line I think there is some commentary there that you can draw between there and what is happening with world politics. Because also, let's be honest, when a U.S. presidential candidate is colluding with the Russian president, that's not just U.S. politics anymore. That's world politics. There's consequences for everybody in the world. I think it's a message that can't be ignored. And so it is a beautiful book, but I also think it's an important book. And if you're not sure about what to read next, I think it needs to be this. I think this is something that we all need to be reading. We need to be talking about. We need to be thinking about. And I mean, again, if you're in the U.S., make sure you show up and vote. Yeah, I actually am looking at my mail-in ballot directly <laughs> like behind my computer screen nice. right now because I live in a state with it. I'd also say when you're talking about like nice things you can do or things you can do, uh, a major shout out to a woman that has completely changed my life named Brie. And she, every single election midterm in between all of them, there's a big gathering that she always hosts where like we unpack what the double wording is in every single measure down ballot. And mm. you can ask questions and get clarification with people from both sides. She does not push you to vote any specific way, but she makes it accessible. There's a lot of websites and things that do that too. So just, you know, it is labor, but it's meant to be mm. labor because a lot of people want you to think something by double speak. And I don't know. Speaking of double things, is this one of those books that you need to 
go back and reread once you know the end? Like, is it kind of one of those like full circle oh, swings? Thank you for asking that. For me, yes, I want to go back to the beginning. Now that I know more about Katarina, her story, the things that she reveals later on, I want to go back to the beginning and read it all again because. I was already trying to pay close attention to like her looks, like the look she gives, the smile she gives. Like there are just some characters where like the dialogue actually happens in the physicality. But now that I know more about her, instead of reading into what she's doing, I just want to read what she's doing. Yeah, I love those kinds of books where you go back and you just learn more all over again. I mean, it's like loser of the year, right? You get to the end of that and you're like, well, guess I'm, what? I, gotta I go was back honestly... And read it. <laughs> I was sitting in Norway at a cafe and you're like, Bex, did you, did you get to the twist? And like, I look at it and like, I was like, no. And I put the book down and I read the next chapter and I'm like, Brenna, did you get to the twist? <laughs> like, <laughs> and like, we're like on three different, three different uh -huh. countries, like blowing each other's phones up at the time. And it's like, yeah. And I immediately went back and reread it because I was like, wait, I need to, I need to specifically approach one character very differently going forward yes. with everything. And, you know, a testament to people who tell these stories and, and create this magic because like it was all there, but unless you knew it was there, it just looked like the mundane, which is very hard to do. I'm very intrigued by this book strictly because I hear about two ballerinas and I only assume one can be prima. And like as a child who grew up during the center stage, like movie era, I was like, oh, is it going to be like, you know, which one can be the prima on stage, which can wear the red shoes, so to speak. So it's exciting to hear in addition to whatever narrative may be there, there's also this kind of unseen competition that just happens by birth and location as a as oh. another foe. Well, see, and that's exactly the kind of like, I feel like I can't talk about it without spoilers. It is so, the book- This is why the After most, Dark episodes need this, to exist for right? clearly. Is we need oh you, my God. <laughs> you and Chris to unpack the things that you can pay to find out without it being a spoiler, so. <laughs> yeah, the books, some books are- maddening to try to review or talk about on here when I love them and to talk about most or any of the details means ruining the experience for other people and so anyway okay. if y'all read this book come talk to me later because I need to talk to some people about this book <laughs> here's my pitch to you for for yes. a panel for next year for GCLS in addition okay. to reviews I hope you do that again I think we need to have a panel where it's like, we're going to name these five books that we just like, we desperately wish we could have said this, but it's so spoilery. And we'll talk about like with the passion of like the conviction of a spoiler um, and what happens uh -huh. when you can finally share it at that level. And what does that look like when talking to others, but trying to also save that for people who haven't experienced it yet. Uh -huh. But the, the entire understanding of this panel is we're going to drop spoilers. You're going to find out, you know, Sorry to tell everybody, old yeller dies. Like that's the most, like yeah. there's going to be those moments. So yeah. I'm in. I'm so in. I would love to do that. That sounds incredible. So yeah. The reverence. only panel that takes place after 7 p.m. at night. <laughs> you know, oh so. yeah. Everybody shows up with a drink and the authors are advised. Maybe this isn't one you want to be at if you wrote the book. Um, or maybe you do. I don't know. Like, because also it's not that I want to... Authors are also I, readers, though, so... Oh, they are. No, no, no. I mean, if it's their books being being oh, discussed. Yeah. I mean, maybe True. they do. But I mean, at that point, it's more of a... That's kind of the difference between... That's... Yeah, it's that difference between literary analysis and reviewing. Because mm -hmm. reviewing, you have to be very careful not to reveal too much. And what I want to do sometimes is literary analysis. And I can't because it would spoil too much <laughs> and you're like so no the curtains are blue distinctively because if we really go back to the time that like this engaged with that you will completely see that she only comments at that time that there's another color preference anywhere in the entire novel and see? people are like it's not that deep and i'm like but creativity is that deep so noticing it is okay to do it's fine yeah I do, well, and I do occasionally call out some of those details sometimes like, and this was really special because this is, and then I'll see or get a note from an author mm -hmm. that's like, you saw that, you yes. saw the things. And I'm like, yeah, dude, cause you put it in there. You, you yeah. wrote it. So yes, reverence, Milena Mackay, go get it. Come let I me know what you think. I just added it to my cart. So Yay! Yeah. I'll talk to you after I get to the, I mean, full candid, I know the twist. I'm fine with that. But yeah, I'll definitely reach out to you. And then there's a yes. third party member who I expect to read it and reach out to both of us. So yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
that is all for this episode bex thank you so so much for joining me thank you oh my goodness if you get this offer y'all jump on this this is like honestly some of the most fun i've had in a very long time and i have a lot of fun in life so like <laughs> definitely hang out with tara chris i'm wishing you the best at women's week and my heart's heavy to not share it with you but i know you're kicking ass so keep doing it and thank you to everybody. If you've listened this far, if you've enjoyed the show, you haven't subscribed yet. I say this every time. Why didn't you subscribe? Please hit that button so you can get notified for new episodes. If you have a friend that you think would be interested in any of what we've talked about, please just pass them on the link or tell them about it. And if you want to support us, we have links in our show notes to our coffee and our newsletter sign up. We also are on most social media sites. So just look up Queerly Recommended or you can email us at podcast at queerlyrecommended.com. Goodbye, everybody. Bye.